Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming today. We are the Center for Climate Science and Engineering at the University of Toronto, and we host monthly guest lectures. I am Daniela Boden, the CSE Manager, and today we are pleased to feature Dr. Samuel Markov from University of California, Merced. So before we get started, uh, I would like to go through the land acknowledgement. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Toro Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Okay, if you haven't been here before, we are the Center of Climate Science and Engineering a research and education center within the civil and mineral engineering department at the University of Toronto, established in 2019. So the CSC team is made up now of eight faculty members who conform the executive team and who participate together in an interdisciplinary research at the intersection of engineering and climate science. So OI American, uh, she is the di center director and she focuses on a structural analysis. Uh, Marianne Hatopolo focuses on transportation. Paul Kushner looks at climate dynamics. Bram Norval, uh, he is a professor emeritus who focuses on health and process safety. Daniel Posen, who looks at life cycle assessment. Karen Smith, atmospheric science. Marianne Tucci, building science. And now, we have um, Samuel Mark Markov, uh, who focuses on sustainability and resilience, and who actually is our guest speaker today. And then me, the CSC manager. So why we work together and what we are trying to do. So within some of the key activities going on at the center is education around climate science and engineering, there are two graduate courses that have been developed and run in UFT on top of eight online e-learning models that were developed and are available for use in Ontario higher education environments. Then we have uh, research. Our team also works to do research. So the faculty members are carrying out a collaborative research project at the inter intersection of the climate science and engineering. And finally, we also do outreach events, just like this one, where we invite the public or other university people to come and give presentations about topics that we feel are aligned with the mandate and the vision we have at the center. And um, so please uh, stay tuned through the CFT channels, including our website, LinkedIn, EFT Engineering Connect uh, account as well, and even Bright. Uh, to know more details for the next guest lecture. So now I would like to introduce uh, today's guest lecture speaker. So Dr. Samuel Markov is an assistant professor within the Department of Civil Engineering and Environmental Engineering uh, at the University of uh, UC Merced. His research applies system thinking to sustainability and resilience challenges facing cities and infrastructure systems. This includes um, examining impacts and responses to extreme events within transportation systems, analyzing the extent to which interconnected social, ecological, technological systems, and exploring the incorporation of climate projections into infrastructure design process. He aims to help decision makers become more adept and identifying, anticipating, alleviating, and responding to accelerating climate, technological, and social change. He was a research fellow on the NSF-sponsored Urban Resilience to Extreme Sustainability Research Network at Arizona State University. So welcome again, Sam, and uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Daniela and CSC and University of Toronto for uh, having me. I'm, I'm very uh, excited to be here today to kind of um, exchange some ideas and share some of our recent and ongoing work related to the pursuit of resilience in urban and infrastructure systems. So at the highest level, this work is 
motivated by the fact that despite increased effort, attention, resources, and understanding, extreme events and climate change continue to pose a significant and regular threat to people, ecosystems, and infrastructure. And beyond climate change, there's a number of social, ecological, and technological factors that have exhibited near exponential growth over the past few hundred years. For instance, uh, global populations, global income levels, the number of dams constructed globally, the number of cars owned globally, uh, loss of biodiversity, and even the number of McDonald's restaurants across the globe have all exhibited this exponential growth pattern. Um, and these broad system traits and dynamics create a suite of challenges as well as opportunities for our infrastructure and our urban systems moving forward. Uh, and in particular, it raises the question of how can we ensure that our infrastructure and our cities are able to respond to and ideally thrive under these conditions of concurrent and profound change. One potential answer or piece of the puzzle to this question is the idea of resilience. So um, that's kind of be kind of the, the focus uh, of, of this talk, kind of giving a little bit of an overview of um, kind of the traditional perspective of resilience from, from within engineering. Uh, as well as identifying some potential avenues that that traditional perspective can grow and evolve to hopefully be better adept at, um, at handling some of these concurrent system changes and, and dynamics. So I know this is uh, kind of a diverse audience. So uh, just to kind of make sure we're all starting from a relatively level starting point, um, I like to kind of just start with a definition of resilience. Um, there's many different perspectives and definitions of resilience. This is by no means kind of the end all be all, but I think this is a good one for the purposes of this talk, at least as a starting point. So um, the National Academy of Science defines it as the ability to plan and prepare for, absorb, recover from, and adapt to uh, adverse events. With this perspective in mind, um, there's also been kind of the emergence of this idea of a critical functionality curve as a way to uh, at least visualize, if not even quantify what this, what resilience might look like. Um, so whether you're looking at a transportation system, a water system, or in this case, uh, an electrical power system, um, you can see the, the kind of system function on the y-axis, in this case, the delivery of uh, electricity. So you can uh, envision that as megawatt hours, for example. Uh, and then on the x-axis, we have time. So uh, starting kind of towards the left side of the figure, there's the planning and preparing phase. So trying to identify what your threats or hazards might be and what you can maybe do to uh, proactively get ready for them then there may be some sort of extreme event or disruption that inhibits the functionality of your system. So in this case, we would have a decrease in the amount uh, or quality of electricity delivered. The extent of that decrease is the absorb phase. You will hit kind of your low point for a little bit and then begin to recover as you can, um, as your system can either naturally come back online or if you can make repairs to damage components. Uh, and then this last piece is critical, but um, sometimes overlooked is the adapt. So what have you learned from that event? What changes can you make moving forward to hopefully avoid a similar type of event or disruption from, from happening again? Um, and kind of the nice thing about this perspective is it does uh, facilitate the a way to kind of quantify in some ways what your resilience is. So some folks have proposed essentially using the area uh, of this of this curve or the shaded area the the as a way to quantify the overall resilience of your system. So essentially, the smaller this area is for any given event or situation, the more resilient your system is believed to be. So that means you either ha uh, are better able at absorbing or able to recover more quickly or both, uh, all with the idea of kind of 
reducing the area under the curve here and improving your overall system resilience. So I think this is a great starting point uh, and, and foundation to build on in, in terms of conceptualizing resilience. Um, however, the the kind of the thesis of, of, of the next few slides will, will kind of center around the idea that there's opportunities to kind of expand and build on this kind of perspective on resilience uh, to hopefully get us to an even more um, adaptable space and uh, operation of our infrastructure systems and our urban systems. And in particular, there's kind of four key factors that uh, that we feel kind of warrant some uh, additional consideration and exploration when we're considering what system resilience means for our infrastructure and for our cities. So those four key factors are uh, kind of consideration and incorporation of climate change, uh, incorporation of complexity and, and acknowledgement of the interconnectedness of our systems, uh, exploration of the feedbacks within our technological systems, but also among broader social and ecological systems, uh, as well as a kind of a, a better incorporation of ethics and equity considerations in our analysis and planning. So I'll kind of step through uh, each of these uh, going forward. So starting with climate change and climate non-stationarity. Uh, much of our infrastructure design standards, criteria, and practices are predicated on the idea of stationarity, um, where the properties of a system are usually assumed not to change over time, or at least change in very predictable ways. However, due to climate change, uh, as well as a host of other factors like population and demographic shifts, we seem to be entering a period of non-stationarity. Um, so in essence, the past may, may no longer be a reliable predictor or indicator of our future, and the infrastructure systems may be entering a period where they are designed for conditions that no longer persist. Uh, so it should be noted that although it frequently appears to be the case, climate non-stationarity does not necessarily mean that infrastructure will always be under-designed for future conditions. There may, in fact, be cases where infrastructure can become over-designed uh, if extreme events become less intense or less frequent as a result of climate change. But regardless if it's moving towards under-designed or over-designed, um, oh, excuse me, these um, non-stationarity conditions uh, presented by climate change and other factors may undermine the, the data and approaches upon which much of our quantitative understanding and management of infrastructure risk is based. Therefore, the design criteria based on historical return periods and past data will likely become less reliable. And in their stead, efforts should be made to develop and implement design standards that are increasingly forward-looking and capable of handling conditions of non-stationarity. So that's kind of the, the conceptual basis for, for this uh, key point. Um, and kind of zooming in and looking a little bit more at, at what it might mean from a practical standpoint, we can um, look at how design criteria are actually established in, in different situations. And here we'll kind of look at an example from uh, the city of Phoenix. Um, so although they exist for a variety of hazards and infrastructure, design storm criteria are most prevalent in stormwater management and flood control. And they refer to the amount of rainfall uh, used to determine the type, size, and location of infrastructure. Design storms for extreme precipitation and stormwater are often expressed in terms of a return period, such as a 10-year or a 100-year event, which is essentially a shorthand for annual probability of a specific event occurring in any given year. So for example, the annual probability of a 10-year storm is one in 10 or 10%, and the annual probability of a 100-year storm is one in 100 or 1%. So once you've established that return period, uh, there are resources available for, um, uh, for uh, such as um, in the United States, we often use the Atlas 14 
produced by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and this resource can be used to create intensity, frequency, duration, or IDF curves to determine the amount of rainfall that the infrastructure should be built to handle. So looking at the figure and maps here for Phoenix, um, assuming a return period of 100 years, the stormwater management infrastructure would need to be uh, able to handle between 0 0.6 and 3.35 inches. And that range depends on the type of storm for which you were designing. Um, so the city of Phoenix has selected uh, a two hour storm event as their basis for design. Um, and so its infrastructure must be capable of handling at least 2.16 inches of rainfall. And so connecting back to kind of what I spoke, of, spoke to on the previous slide, this approach is perfectly well suited for stable conditions or conditions of stationarity, but it does not really consider climate change uh, or other factors like um, population growth, changes to land use, um, et cetera, that can, all of those can have uh, significant influences on the amount of rainfall, the amount of runoff, and ultimately the ability of the infrastructure to actually fulfill its objectives of managing the stormwater and protecting the people and um, infrastructure located nearby. So the kind of the takeaway here is that in a changing world, it is it may be necessary to adopt design criteria across a number of different hazards uh, and regularly revisit that criteria based on both observed as well as projected changes in climate. Um, and then as a segue to the next topic, uh, it's also important to think holistically across different sectors uh, and infrastructure types. So our stormwater infrastructure doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's all kinds of changes happening around it. It must interact with other infrastructure systems. And so the more we can kind of consider those interactions, hopefully the better off we'll be. So speaking of those, those interactions, um, the, the, the second key thing that uh, perhaps warrants some further exploration and consideration is this system complexity and interconnectedness that is current in our infrastructure systems and seems to be growing within our infrastructure systems. Our systems are seeming to become more complex and more interconnected. Um, and so what we'll do here is kind of step through some of the different types of uh, interconnections that exist and then connect them to uh, climate hazards and possible pathways of disruption that can emerge from these different interconnections. So the first one is kind of the most common and easiest to kind of think about and conceptualize and often the one that receives the most attention. Uh, and this is a direct physical um, interconnection. So this could be something like um, uh, an abrupt impact to physical infrastructure from any hazard. So thinking about the washout of a bridge due to flooding, the overtopping of a dam or a levee, um, things like that. So this is kind of the, the, the most common type that, that we often think about. But beyond that, um, some of the ones that are less explored uh, include direct non-physical interconnections, which relate to kind of the impacts that human health, behavior, and decision-making can have on our infrastructure. So an example here might be a shift in practices or operation that can lead to some negative or unintended consequences. Um, a clear example of this is the snowstorm that happened in the Atlanta area in uh, 2014, um, which is pictured here. And you can kind of see some of the implications of that storm event where there was Kind of sustained gridlock on uh, many of the system, uh, the city's roadways for several hours, uh, and in some extreme cases, people had to spend the night on the highway uh, before things could kind of get cleared and, and return to normal. And what was really happening here was, um, although snow is not super common in Atlanta, it's not unprecedented, and this was by no means an unprecedented storm from kind of historical perspectives. Um, but what happened was uh, decision makers in the city were kind of eyeing the forecast and saw that the storm was coming in and likely to 
to hit uh, hit the city. So they recommended that folks leave work and school early to get home and and get to, or get to a safe location before the storm hit. Unfortunately, the forecast the forecast was slightly off and the storm hit a little earlier than anticipated, coinciding with when the decision makers had recommended that everyone try and get home. Uh, and so the picture here is kind of the result of that. So the physical infrastructure itself was fine. There wasn't really any significant damage to the roadways or, or anything like that. Nonetheless, the service of mobility was still disrupted primarily due to the forecasting issues and the uh, decision makers um, recommendations that folks try to get home earlier than they, than, than they normally would. The next type of uh, interconnection and, and pathway of disruption that we can see is what we call indirect physical. Um, and this relates primarily to interconnections or co-locations of infrastructure. So here you could think of a power outage disrupting our ability to pump or treat water, um, power generation cur curtailed due to water temperature issues or water availability issues. Um, and we see some examples shown here. In 2014, there was a major water main break uh, in Los Angeles that was kind of co-located with a roadway. And so what started as a disruption in the water sector cascaded into a disruption into the transportation network. Um, and then there's been a number of instances where um, electricity generation has had to be curtailed due to a number of water-related issues. So. Uh, in the case of hydroelectric production in the Western United States, that had to be curtailed uh, under some drought conditions. Um, and then in kind of thermo, um, uh, thermo power generation, um, it, that's had to be curtailed in some instances where the um, waste heat from the steam is too hot to be put back into the surrounding bodies of water. So they've had to curtail, um, curtail their power generation due to environmental concerns. So again, we're having this kind of cascading effect where if you were in one infrastructure sector and not necessarily cognizant or aware of these uh, interconnections, you can still be subject to some risks or vulnerabilities or disruptions um, that may not be front of mind if you're only focusing on kind of your system in a vacuum. Uh, and then finally, we have the indirect non-physical pathways. Um, and these are disruptions that result from loss of data or information inputs or other mechanisms such as social or financial considerations. Uh, an example here could be a an outage in information communication technologies, uh, disrupting uh, signaling and controlling capabilities in the transportation sector, for example. So we've seen that uh, in, in multiple ways in, the, in air travel. So there's been a number of instances where the computer systems that airlines and airports kind of use to, um, to facilitate their operations have gone down. And then that has cascaded into uh, delayed or canceled flights. So the planes are fine, the runways are fine, the airport infrastructure is fine, uh, but this kind of cascade from the information side of things um, to the physical movement of people um, still occurs. And then we've also seen some examples um, such as the Flint water crisis, where financial and um, policy decisions led to a shift in the water supply for Flint, which then transpired into some significant water quality and availability issues for many of the citizens in that area. Um, and then recurring flooding in places like Houston, where climate change is a factor, but also uh, planning and land use change are also um, contributing to, to some of the issues. And, and we'll return to the Houston example uh, in a few slides. So kind of looking at what this consideration of these different pathways and interconnections, um, how that can translate into practice, um, we have kind of a, a scenario here where you might be trying to understand the, the possible risks or disruptions from uh, extreme heat to mobility or to the transportation network. So if you're only focusing on those kind of direct physical pathways uh, of disruption, 
these are some of the primary ones that might emerge. So catenary wire sag could increase and uh, decrease the or disrupt um, electrified uh, light rail transportation, for example. Uh, roads and rails can buckle under extreme heat conditions. Vehicles can overheat. Uh, thermal expansion joints and bridges can uh, exceed their design capacity. Uh, air flights can be canceled, um, things like that. So there's already enough to kind of think about and work through by just focusing on the direct physical pathways. But what we'll see here is that's only kind of a small piece of the pie. Um, so if we add in these other interconnections and, and different uh, pathways of disruption, you can kind of see that there are a number of different vulnerabilities and risks that can go potentially underexplored or unexplored, um, but nonetheless can still result in uh, closures or disruptions to road networks or uh, other, other infrastructure and ulti ultimately transpire to a decrease in mobility, which is what you're hoping to avoid uh, by thinking through some of the, some of the um, uh, vulnerabilities and, and risks here. So again, this is just the, to, to underscore the importance of trying to think across different sectors, different infrastructure systems, and really think through how these interconnections and system complexities can transpire in sometimes um, surprising or non-intuitive ways or pathways of disruption. So the third factor that uh, seems to warrant some additional consideration when we're thinking about system resilience relates directly to the previous two. Um, and it's um, interconnections and dynamic feedbacks within and among urban and infrastructure systems that, uh, that they're often confronted with um, uh, they're, they're not, they don't exist in a vacuum. So not only are urban and infrastructure systems comprised of those integrated infrastructure elements that we kind of discussed on the previous slides, um, but there's also uh, a number of interconnected social, ecological, and technological systems at play. Um, and these interconnected social, ecological, technological systems begin to um, change the system and the system dynamics as soon as uh, your infrastructure is, is installed. So uh, what we see here in the picture is kind of a non-exhaustive list of kind of what we consider to be social components, ecological components, and technological components. Um, so on the social th side of things, we can see a number of things like um, rules, codes, regulations, financial considerations, um, uh, user preferences and behavior. On the ecological side of things, we have uh, kind of environmental quality, climate, uh, wildlife habitat. And then on the technological side, we have kind of those infrastructure systems that we've already um, been discussing. And so kind of returning to the, the Houston example that I mentioned, um, we can kind of see how these different sets dynamics can emerge and influence the broader system over time. So in addition to extreme weather and climate conditions, um, recent flooding issues in Houston are likely exacerbated by the lack of strict zoning laws in the area rapid population growth, uh, as well as urban sprawl over the past several decades. Um, and in particular, since the construction of two of the region's primary flood control mechanisms, which are the Attics and Baker Reservoirs in the 1940s, much of the population growth and development, um, and then the related decrease in per permeability that has happened as a result of that, has occurred in the suburban areas upstream of these reservoirs. Um, and so that's drastically altered the hydrologic conditions for which the reservoirs were initially designed. And so elements of this phenomenon are depicted on the slide here, uh, where we see satellite images showing the growth and development that occurred around the Baker Reservoir between um, 1984 and 2016. Um, and then kind of focusing on that kind of diagram on the upper right, um, we can kind of see from this and, and applying this sets lens to 
to this system, we can see at various times, different social, ecological, and technological elements are exerting influence over the system. Um, so the social elements include, you know, population change, uh, pursuit of affordable housing and land, which, which kind of um, contributes to urban sprawl that has ecological influences in terms of decreasing permeability, um, decreasing um, the, the local eco ecological systems. Uh, and then we have this kind of big technological component to it, the, being the, the, the reservoir, which is meant to kind of protect those social and ecological systems. So we see that kind of, again, there's varying uh, elements of influence from those S, E, and T components at different times. The another important thing to note is that social concerns are often exclusively addressed via technological strategies. So here, the the social concern related to unpredictability of the the local watershed and the and the proclivity of it to periodically flood um, led to the construction of these large reservoir systems, which is a T heavy um, strategy. A te technology heavy strategy. And then when you implement these large technological systems, that can often lead to path dependence and lock in, uh, which you can kind of observe by the feedback loop shown there in the dashed line, um, where you have an installation of a large technologically based system, which can contribute to an e increased perception of control and safety. This increased perception of control and safety can lead to um, increased growth and development in the area, which then leads to more people exposed to any potential disruption. And then you kind of need to come back and reinforce your infrastructure to reduce that exposure. And you can kind of see how that lock-in and that feedback loop um, starts to emerge. And then the, the final factor that uh, we view as kind of important and warrants some further consideration is um, that traditional design practices and, cr and criteria can contribute to various forms of what is called maladaptation, uh, which can be defined as actions taken to reduce vulnerability in one context that ultimately increase vulnerability or adverse effects in other contexts or amongst other groups. So for example, design criteria appear to mostly align with um, kind of a, an emphasis on resisting disturbances or returning to normalcy. However, this approach can be misaligned with emerging thinking that frames resilience as a dynamic and iterative process that emphasizes the ability to transform and change. So by kind of trying to return to normalcy, you may be hindering your ability to transform or change or adapt in the face of continual or sometimes surprising stresses. Um, the design criteria can also contribute to um, malad maladaptive outcomes in governance. In particular, the knowledge, skill sets, and data uh, required to conduct and interpret um, some of the approaches that are commonly used can result in inequitable power dynamics and outcomes amongst different groups. So for example, community members who are not well funded or not well versed in some of these calculative practices may have difficulty engaging in productive discourse or negotiation of specific resilience policies and practices. However, they are often the ones that are uh, most impacted whenever an extreme event or disruption does occur. Um, likewise, some more qualitative objectives, something you know, th something like quality of life or walkability, um, or novel but uncertain approaches like nature-based solutions, may be overlooked or de-emphasized because they do not align as well with the uh, parameters of a particular. Uh, calculative practice or viewpoint of the inst institutions conducting the analysis. Um, oops, excuse me. So there is lots of opportunity to practice co-production techniques where members of vulnerable and impacted communities have a more inclusive role in the design, use, and even uh, transformation of our infrastructure systems. 
And doing so can hopefully enable a more holistic consideration of key questions such as resilience of what, resilience to what, resilience for whom, and resilience with what trade-offs. So these are very much uh, outstanding questions that we collectively need to get better at uh, asking and answering. And then just kind of highlighting these implications a little bit more in, in an example, um, I encourage you to kind of think through this, this scenario a little bit. So this is kind of a, a hypothetical. So due to extreme precipitation, a local reservoir is close to overflowing and its failure appears imminent. So in this case, what would you do? Um, the choices are either to open the spillway to drain water from the reservoir, which would limit the risk of flooding to the local neighborhoods, but likely cause flooding in the historic downtown. Um, the other option would be to keep the spillway closed in order to limit flooding in the historic downtown, but potentially cause flooding in local neighborhoods. So uh, I encourage everyone to just think on that for a few seconds. And if you want, you can even um, drop your, your response in the chat uh, if, if you feel like uh, chiming in. Um, but uh, while that's happening, yeah, I see some responses coming in, thanks. Um, so I, I, I pitched this as a kind of a hypothetical, but in reality, it's actually not that hypothetical. So um, elements of this scenario have, have played out in a few different cases. Uh, and in particular, again, returning to our Houston example, that was kind of the decision that the uh, Army Corps of Engineers was grappling with um, during Hurricane Harvey in 2017, when they had to decide basically between opening the spillway at the Baker Reservoir and flooding some of the downstream areas, including the uh, including downtown, or keeping the spillway closed, but risk the levee overtopping and the surrounding neighborhoods near the reservoir uh, being flooded. They decided to open the spillway uh, to kind of protect the areas closer to the reservoir and flood some of the areas downstream. Uh, and then similarly in 2001, the Army Corps of Engineers was kind of faced with a, another similar case where there was a lot of precipitation uh, along the Missouri River and uh, levees there were in jeopardy of overtopping. So they actually decided to blow up uh, a levee to alleviate some of that pressure and prevent potential catastrophic flooding in some cities downstream. Uh, but they ended up flooding some of the smaller towns and farmland located near the levee. So again, these tough decisions that have some kind of uh, equity implications, ethics implications um, are have happened and have precedent. And so anything we can do to incorporate those uh, ethical and equity conversations and decisions into earlier into the process and think through them more proactively as opposed to being forced to make a tough choice um, in the in the heat of an event. Uh, the, the better we can do that more proactively, hopefully the better off we'll be um, in the long run. So those are kind of four key factors that um, we kind of view are important for kind of adding and building on that kind of traditional perspective on resilience um, and so what does that leave us kind of moving forward? So I'll quickly kind of step through some emerging approaches to resilience um, to kind of hopefully think through how we can start to incorporate some of those factors into uh, our traditional perspectives. And so one way is to kind of pursue interdisciplinary thought. Um, so engineering is not the only discipline that you know has thought about resilience or grapples with resilience issues. There's actually a lot of work in social and ecological sciences uh, in exploring how ecosystems and even people uh, exhibit resilience and what characteristics those people and ecosystems tend to have uh, in order to be more resilient. And so some of those are listed here. So there's an interesting opportunity to kind of see what some of those um, well-established and well-studied and understood traits or principles of resilience from ecology and social sciences are and how we could maybe look to incorporate those into uh, engineering more uh, and, and, and think of how they could potentially contribute to our uh, engineering design and implementation moving forward. Um, and then the other kind of emerging uh, perspective is 
moving beyond thinking of resilience as kind of an endpoint or a goal, but instead thinking of it as a process. Um, and so there's a number of different approaches that have been kind of proposed to, to, to contribute to this. Uh, I just highlighted one here that's kind of been framed the SOL framework, sensing, anticipating, adapting, and learning. So the idea here is that by iteratively going through a process of sensing, anticipating, adapting, and then learning, um, you'll kind of, your system will naturally be kind of on the continual trajectory towards resilience. Um, there's some other uh, ideas that are similar to this. So um, adaptive management kind of has some of these ideas. Um, things like robust decision making also have a, a lot of these elements. But again, the main takeaway here is, is moving away from resilience as an endpoint, which is kind of what it's depicted as in that traditional perspective, you know, thinking about the area under that first graph I showed, that's kind of a stationary uh, endpoint, moving beyond that towards this continual process. And so as I kind of begin to wrap up here in the next five or so minutes, uh, I just want to highlight um, kind of a project that that is uh, ongoing where we've been trying to apply uh, some of these kind of emerging approaches and, and in particular this one probably is best at capturing that sensing and anticipating component of the of the SOL framework. So uh, in particular we've been piloting the installation of low-cost sensors on public transit vehicles in Phoenix as a way to better understand um, uh, exposure to extreme heat and air pollution uh, in, in the city. And so a little bit of motivation for this one, um, despite many positive attributes, the Phoenix region is unfortunately uh, home to some of the worst air quality and extreme temperatures in the United States. And exposure to these uh, extreme heat and air pollution contribute to a wide range of health concerns, including increased mortality and hospitalizations for the region's citizens, uh, especially members of underrepresented and underserved populations. Uh, and this is not an issue that's unique to Phoenix, so just kind of highlighting a couple of headlines from this summer. Um, there's kind of record-setting heat waves uh, across much of the Western United States this, this year, uh, as well as across Canada, and similarly we saw uh, issues in Europe and Asia emerging. So this idea of extreme heat and and, uh, and air pollution as well are, are, are something that most communities are grappling with in some form or another uh, across the globe. And so getting back to the Phoenix specific context, um, ongoing efforts to understand and mitigate these threats typically rely on a series of stationary temperature and air quality monitoring uh, systems that are distributed throughout the county. Um, however, the air pollution and extreme heat are experienced at the human scale, not the county scale. Um, and so in the absence of human scale monitoring and analysis, um, we are left with operating under some um, relatively coarse assumptions and extrapolations about exposure, uh, which in turn can complicate the consideration and implementation of the mitigation efforts. So these maps just kind of highlight, um, uh, especially in those red circles, some kind of areas in Phoenix that are, don't really have any monitoring sites located uh, near them. Um, so that's kind of where that extrapolation has to take place. And then the, the map on the upper right just kind of highlights that um, there is, even within a relatively, you know, within a city, there is some uh, relatively high vari variability in terms of air quality. So in the upper left, you can see that uh, air quality um, was bordering on unhealthy, uh, whereas in other areas that are not too far away, it's, it's, it's perfectly um, healthy or, or good. So there's this wide spatial and temporal variability that can happen. Uh, and we don't quite have a full grasp of that variability just yet. And so that's where this approach can potentially help fill some gaps. Um, so given these, these needs and challenges, we've piloted the installation of low cost sensors on um, some buses in Phoenix. Um, 
the sensors are capable of monitoring a number of different um, criteria, but uh, for the purposes of this study, we focused on temperature and particulate matter. Um, and we focused on a particular route, uh, which is known as the Maryvale circulator. This emerged as a route of focus for a couple of reasons. Um, one, Maryville comprises a large uh, proportion of underserved and underrepresented communities. Um, and it covers an area that's not currently well aligned with the existing network of stationary monitors. Um, so getting into some of our findings, um, the what we can see here is some of the temperature measurements from the Maryville circulator that were taken during the summer. Um, and I do want to point out here that in, instead of employing raw temperature data recorded by the mobile sensor, um, we use temperature differences between the mobile sensor and nearby monitoring sites uh, in order to account for temporal variability of temperature over the course of the observation period. And so um, on both of the observation days shown here, several locations and corridors uh, along the Maryville circulator are noticeably warmer um, than the rest of the than the rest of the route, indicating that these are potential hotspots where residents and transit uh, riders are exposed to greater heat impacts than the rest of the population. Um, and so uh, this is oops, excuse me. <laughs> And so this is a, an area that does not have nearby monitors, but if it did, um, there, would, uh, there would be one representative value for temperature. However, as we can see from the figures, one value for the entire neighborhood is not indicative of the actual conditions. Um, and there is some noticeable variability in the spatial and temporal exposure that is occurring. Um, and in addition to being able to identify these hotspots, um, we can see how they vary across time and geography. Some of the hotspots show up all the time, while some pop up at specific times and locations. Um, and so ultimately, this approach can provide us with a level of nuance and deeper insights uh, than we currently have uh, using the kind of stationary monitoring network. Um, and then beyond kind of identifying those those hotspots or seeing how they can um, kind of vary spatially or temporally, we can we can kind of zoom into them to try and understand the the specific context a little bit better. And so what we're seeing here is um, one of the, the 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 areas that kind of frequently most or most frequently showed up as as one of these hotspots for both air pollution and extreme temperatures. Um, and it points us to uh, a mall and a transit center that is kind of co-located with the mall. Um, in particular, this transit center serves more than 68,000 riders per month and nine different bus routes. Um, and so we found that to be a particularly noteworthy um, uh, insight because the the riders or the users of that transit center are going to be potentially experiencing um, the uh or it potentially exposed to this heat and air quality more so than other citizens in the area so you can picture them walking to and from the transit center as well as waiting outside for their bus connections or things like that so ha the fact that this approach can help us identify this 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 area that is kind of ripe for targeted mitigation efforts um, further underscores some of the benefits that we can get from these more spatially and temporally re refined understandings of uh, heat and, and um, air quality conditions across the city. So there's lots of uh, potential for this work moving forward, lots to still um, explore. Um, but uh, I think just as, as I begin to wrap up, um, just wanna kind of emphasize that despite the, the challenges and issues described throughout this presentation, um, traditional engineering practices have provided a lot of benefit and are likely to remain a fundamental component of infrastructure development and implementation for many years to come. However, considering that there are limits to how much infrastructure systems can be expanded or enhanced, some fundamental shifts may be warranted in how we think about risk and resilience in the design and implementation of our infrastructure systems. So to that end, concepts like set thinking, uh, aided by novel data collection and modeling approaches, such as what we've been piloting in Phoenix, show promise for facilitating the adaptation and transformation 
of infrastructure systems in the face of increasingly complex and changing conditions. And the topics and concepts outlined here uh, should be thought of as a starting place for much of the research and analysis that still need to be done. Um, as these efforts progress, design criteria and infrastructure resilience practices can continue to evolve in a manner that increasingly weighs the broad impacts of actions or inactions across all members of society and be conducted in a manner that is as open, transparent, inclusive, and effective as possible. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a number of collaborators that, um, that I've worked with uh, throughout, the, throughout these series of, of studies and thinking. Um, and I thank you all again for the opportunity to, to, to join you today and speak with you. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any thoughts or interests in discussing further. Uh, otherwise, I'm happy to take any questions there may be. But yeah, thank you again.